But going to college is not the same as getting an education, though the two are often confused. As I traveled, I discovered a universal hunger, often unvoiced, to be free of managed debate, a desire to be given untainted information. Nobody seems to have maps of where this thing had come from or why it acted as it did, but the ability to smell a rat was alive and well all over America. Exactly what John Dewey heralded at the onset of the 20th century has indeed happened. Our once highly individualized nation has evolved into a centrally managed village, an agora made up of huge special interests which regard individual voices as irrelevant. The masquerade is managed by having collective agencies speak through particular human beings. Dewey said this would mark a great advance in human affairs, but the net effect is to reduce men and women to the status of functions in whatever subsystem they are placed. Public opinion is turned on and off in laboratory fashion, all this in the name of social efficiency, one of the two main goals of forced schooling. Dewey called this transformation the new individualism. When I stepped into the job of school teacher in 1961, the new individualism was sitting in the driver's seat all over urban America, a far cry from my own school days when the Lone Ranger, not Sesame Street, was our nation's teacher, and school things weren't nearly so oppressive. But gradually they became something else in the euphoric times following World War II. Easy money and easy travel provided welcome relief from wartime austerity. The advent of television, the new nonstop theater, offered easy laughs, effortless entertainment. Thus preoccupied, Americans failed to notice the deliberate conversion of formal education that was taking place, a transformation that would turn school into an instrument of the Leviathan state. Who made that happen and why is part of the story I have to tell. School is a religion. Without understanding the holy mission aspect, you're certain to misperceive what takes place as a result of human stupidity or venality or even class warfare. All are present in the equation. It's just that none of these matter very much. Even without them, school would move in the same direction. Dewey's pedagogic creed statement of 1897 gives you a clue to the zeitgeist. Every teacher should realize he is a social servant set apart for the maintenance of the proper social order and the securing of the right social growth. In this way, the teacher is always the prophet of the true God and the usherer in of the true kingdom of heaven. What is proper social order? What does right social growth look like? If you don't know, you're like me, not like John Dewey, who did, or the Rockefellers, his patrons, who did too. Somehow, out of the industrial confusion which followed the Civil War, powerful men and dreamers became certain of what kind of social order America needed, one very like the British system we had escaped a hundred years earlier. This realization didn't arise as the product of public debate, as it should have in a democracy, but as a distillation of private discussion. Their ideas contradicted the original American charter, but that didn't disturb them. They had a stupendous goal in mind, the rationalization of everything, the end of unpredictable history, its transformation into a dependable order. From the mid-century onward, certain utopian schemes to retard maturity in the interests of a greater good were put into play. The first goal to be reached in stages was an orderly, scientifically managed society, one in which the best people would make the decisions unhampered by democratic tradition. After that, human breeding, the evolutionary destiny of the species, would be in reach. Universal institutionalized formal forced schooling was the prescription, extending the dependency of the young well into what had traditionally been early adult life. Individuals would be prevented from taking up important work until a relatively advanced age. Maturity was to be retarded. During the post-Civil War period, childhood was extended about four years. Later, a special label was created to describe very old children. It was called adolescence, a phenomenon hitherto unknown to the human race. The infantilization of young people didn't stop at the beginning of the 20th century. Child labor laws were extended to cover more and more kinds of work. The age of school leaving set higher and higher. The greatest victory for this utopian project was making school the only avenue to certain occupations. The intention was ultimately to draw all work into the school net. By the 1950s, it wasn't unusual to find graduate students, well into their 30s, running errands. 
waiting to start their lives. One system schooling has had a century and a half to prove itself. It is a ghastly failure. Children need the widest possible range of roads in order to find the right one to accommodate themselves. John Taylor Gatton. Captain, my captain. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. Get back you to here. class right now. Sit no. down. Sit down. This is your final warning, Anderson. Yeah. I'll get up. How dare you? Do you hear me? Your captain, my captain. Mr. Overstreet, I warn you. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. All of you. I want you seated.